Tonight, on the Scholar's Chair, a conversation with Dr. Douglas yeah, Johnston. He is the president of the International the Center for Moment, Religion and Democracy. Dr. Johnston is a distinguished graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and holds master's mm. degrees in public day, administration uh, and a Ph.D. In, in political science from Harvard University. He has edited and authored several books, um, including Religion, the Missing Dimension of State Craft, Foreign Policy in the 21st Century, the U.S. Leadership Challenge and faith-based diplomacy trumping real politic. Tonight, at Focus, what is faith-based diplomacy and what are its implications to American foreign policy? Welcome to the Scholar's Chair, Dr. Johnston. We are very proud to have you here on the Scholar's Chair. My first question to you, uh, Dr. Johnston, is what is the mission of the International Center for Religion and, Demo and Diplomacy? Uh, you're the president and founder. Share some information with us. Well, the uh, real mission is to address uh, intractable, identity-based conflicts that exceed the grasp of traditional diplomacy mm -hmm. by incorporating religion as part of the solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 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 what what was the impetus for this for the for the mission of the organization? What was that one spark that uh, that uh, challenged you? Well, it really was the uh, response that we got around the world for uh, a, a book that we published in 1994 called "Religion: The Missing Dimension of Statecraft." Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, during the over the course of the seven years in which it, uh, the book was uh, put together, mm -hmm. uh, the Berlin Wall came down, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden ethnic conflict started to blossom, mm -hmm. and people could uh, uh, see that uh, this juxtaposition of re religious reconciliation with official or unofficial diplomacy mm -hmm. uh, offered greater potential for these, you know, ethnic conflicts, these sorts of things. Uh, than traditional diplomacy. And it was in response to their response that I uh, decided uh, maybe we should walk the talk. Interesting. Faith-based faith, faith diplomacy is a, is a very unique term. I'm still having challenges trying to mm -hmm. pronounce it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's such a new idea, at least in, to my mind. Uh, I have on videotape uh, Dr. Matadine's definition of this term. And uh, what I would like to do is to offer the audience an opportuni uh, the, the opportunity to hear his view uh, and definition of faith-based diplomacy. Better done than it has been in the past by including the dimension of religion. Mm -hmm. uh, what it is is to compare the situation, the existing model of diplomacy, in which religion is marginalized. Mm -hmm. Religion is viewed uh, in the dominant paradigm as <coughs> an irrational phenomena, and therefore outside the model of rational actors that diplomacy is usually based on. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that assumption is wrong, mm -hmm. and faith-based diplomacy says, let's consider that religion is a strong motivating factor of, of human beings, that it's not completely irrational, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> but that people will rationally try to pursue their religious interests and to appeal to people's religious beliefs mm -hmm. in the attempt to persuade them uh, and to engage them and to engage in whatever it may be, peace negotiations or the mm -hmm. attempt to uh, explain a foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Johnston, is religion irrational? Well, it depends on, uh, it's in the eyes of the beholder, I suppose, but uh, to, because it doesn't conform with the rational actor model uh, of decision making, uh, people have assumed that it was irrational and therefore was outside the policymaker's calculus. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, in the final analysis, it gives most, reason, uh, most people their reason for being. Yes. Uh, yes. And whether you consider that rational or irrational, it's uh, terribly important. It's very important. Yeah. Um, give me your definition, faith-based diplomacy, and, uh, and what do you hope for it to accomplish, and how, what are the implications of American foreign policy? 
Well, <clears throat> faith-based diplomacy at the macro level means uh, simply incorporating religious considerations into the practice of international politics. Uh, more simply put, at the micro level, it means making religion part of the solution mm -hmm. in some of these intractable uh, identity-based conflicts. Um, I think it has uh, significant implications for the United States because, uh, you know, for more than for more than a decade now, our defense planners have been wrestling with the challenges of uh, what are called asymmetric threats. Mm -hmm. uh, these uh, are threats uh, that uh, disadvantaged opponents resort to, uh, creative th threats in, in doing you harm, such as uh, bin Laden used on 9-11 to rock our country back on its heels. Mm -hmm. And uh, however, uh, they seem to be uh, coming in terms of uh, responding to that threat. I submit there's not enough money in the U.S. Treasury mm -hmm. to uh, protect this country against the full spectrum of asymmetric threats to mm -hmm. which one might resort. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what's really needed is an asymmetric counter, mm -hmm. one that gets uh, t at the ideas behind the guns. Mm -hmm. Those ideas need to be displaced, and then I think you have a chance of actually prevailing over the long term. Hmm. Is this the, the kind of work that you were doing with the madrasas? I remember hearing a lecture, lecture that you gave, uh, uh, actually wo working, I think, Pakistan, was it, that you were working with the madrasas? Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, if you, if you buy into the assumption that uh, 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 getting at the ideas behind the guns is important, mm -hmm. then the madrasas become very strategic because that's where an awful lot of the problem lies. Mm -hmm. Now these... What is the madrasa? I just, just so the people are... Well, uh, in most of the world, madrasa simply means school. Yeah. But in Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, that area, it really means religious school. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, w back in the Middle Ages, these were the absolute peaks of learning excellence in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were mind-boggling in their excellence. and. And they actually peaked in about uh, the 15th century. Uh, but uh, it was only Western exposure to them that led to the creation of our own university system, you know, and many things like uh, funding a chair in a given discipline or the mortarboard and tassel you wear at graduation was came out of madrasas. Mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately, over time, and particularly under the influence of colonialism, uh, the uh, madrasas sought to purge themselves of all disciplines that they identified with the West mm -hmm. to the point where many of them today are simply about rote memorization of the Quran yes. and the study of Islamic principles. Mm -hmm. And so we have been on the ground in Pakistan for four years now uh, trying to achieve two things. One is to expand their curriculums to include the physical and social sciences, but with a very particular emphasis on human rights, mm -hmm. uh, particularly women's rights, mm -hmm. and religious tolerance. And perhaps even more importantly is to transform the pedagogy to create critical thinking skills among the students. Mm -hmm. Because when we first started out, if a youngster so much as raised his hand in class, he could be punished for being disrespectful. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was strictly a one-way flow. And one of the, the tragedies here is that the, these youngsters, some as young as the age of 12, have memorized the Quran from cover to cover, yeah. but they really don't know what it means. They've memorized it in Arabic. Their language is Urdu, mm -hmm. and they're certainly not given enough Arabic to understand something as sophisticated as the Quran. Mm -hmm. So along comes the local militant, misappropriates a little scripture, as all religions are prone to do okay. from time to time, yeah. to recruit these uh, children to their cause, and uh, th these kids are absolutely... Uh, uh, defenseless. They've got mm -hmm. no ability to question, no ability to challenge. You know? mm -hmm. And where that, uh, how that plays out at a higher level is you can sit down with a madrasa leader and point out to him how something he's doing right now is counterproductive mm -hmm. and take him mm -hmm. through a logic flow to a new conclusion of something that would be useful. Yeah. He can follow that logic. He can embrace the new conclusion, mm -hmm. but he's pretty incapable of, uh, just cannot start that thought process himself. Mm -hmm. They're so, mm -hmm. so tradition bound, if you will, I and try the, the, the tribal uh, mm -hmm. imperatives. Uh, really Looking for the other for yeah. guidance and leadership and cetera, instead right. of the initiative. Exactly. Mm -hmm. they, they, mm -hmm. It gets squeezed out of the, the mm -hmm. equation.